This program depicts exercises and martial arts training that, depending on your physical condition, may be hazardous to your health. Consult with your doctor or martial arts instructor before attempting these techniques. The instructions and advice offered in this presentation are in no way a substitute for supervised professional training. The creators, producers, and participants involved in this program assume no responsibility for any injury or loss that may be incurred while using this program. I'm Jerry Robinson, founder and director of Health for Life. Hello to all of you who've been reading our newsletter and using our courses for the last few years. And to those of you who are meeting Health for Life for the first time, welcome. This tape is the first in a series in which we will apply the principle of synergism, combining elements to create something greater than just the sum of those elements, to martial arts. I don't know of any other physical discipline that requires as much from its participants. Reflex and movement speed, extreme flexibility, tendon and muscular strength, aerobic capacity, even Zen mind. Martial arts is truly a tool that allows you to achieve your full physical potential. As the great masters have done. Miyamoto Musashi, the great samurai. Jack Dempsey, six-time world boxing champ. Julio Martinez Costello, international fencing champion in the 1920s. And most recently, Bruce Lee. These masters all have one thing in common. They didn't just slug it out or start whipping their swords around, nor did they just accept the principles of those who taught them. Each took the time to analyze his movements, to understand what made them work or not work, and to apply science to improve them. All four of these masters were also considered renegades to some degree because they refused to let tradition dictate their technique. Instead, they chose to use whatever worked. And that will be our approach. I'm not going to limit you by teaching you to punch according to the guidelines of a particular style. I'm going to teach you how to take this and get it there at maximum speed with maximum power. To do that, you need to understand some biomechanics, the science of human movement. So we'll start with just a bit of theory. Next, we'll talk about preliminaries, like taping your hands to keep you from injuring yourself while you practice. Then, we'll explore the techniques themselves. We're going to cover four punches. These are of two types, linear and circular. In a linear punch, your fist travels in a straight line to your opponent. The force of the punch is delivered along that line. In a circular punch, your fist travels in an arc. Here, the force is delivered at a right angle to the line between you and your opponent. Having both kinds of punches in your arsenal allows you to take advantage of a wider range of openings. The two linear punches we will consider are a straight punch with the front hand, better known in boxing terms as the jab, a straight punch with the rear hand, which resembles a slightly modified martial arts reverse punch. We'll call this by another familiar boxing term, the cross. The two circular punches are the hook, relatively speaking a short range punch, and finally, the back knuckle. For all four punches, we'll be dealing with the same elements. Footwork, movement at the hips, upper body, shoulder, arm, and finally, hand. If you take the time to work through the techniques on this tape, 
I promise you an improvement in your punching ability bordering on the miraculous. So let's get started. Momentum, the amount of force you have to apply to your opponent's nose, depends on two elements called mass and velocity. For our purposes, let's just say mass is the amount of your body weight you put behind a punch. Velocity is how fast you're moving relative to some point. I'm here, you're there. If I run in that direction, I'll never get to you, even if I'm moving really fast. I have no velocity in relation to you. Actually, physicists would say I have a negative velocity, but negative velocities never won any sparring matches. Mass and velocity are equally important in determining your momentum. That's why a lightweight person who can move quickly can hit just as hard as a heavy person who can't move as fast. Your objective when punching is to generate maximum momentum. This means getting as much of your mass moving as fast as possible in the correct direction. Now, it's possible to generate very high velocities by taking advantage of the fact that velocities can add together. Suppose you're standing still and uh, you throw a ball forward. Let's say that ball is traveling at 10 feet a second. Now, suppose you're in a convertible rolling forward at 5 feet per second and you throw that ball as you did before. Now how fast will the ball be going? Answer, 15 feet per second. The combined velocities of car and ball. You can get that same effect with your body by using sequential movements of different body parts. This is really obvious if you watch a baseball pitcher. First he winds up, then the legs go, then the hips, then the shoulders, the arm, finally wrist, hand, and ball. The velocity of the ball is actually the sum of velocities of all those body parts. In effect, each part is acting from a moving platform, the preceding part in the chain. So hips move faster than legs, shoulder moves faster than hips, arm moves faster than shoulder, and finally, the hand is moving like lightning. To review, point one. The techniques you're about to learn are based on sound biomechanics and not the guidelines of any one martial arts style. Point two. Maximizing punching power involves getting as much of your mass, which we're just going to think of as your body weight, moving as fast as you can in the correct direction. We're going to do that using the principle of adding together velocities of different body parts moving one after another in a continuous sequence. So let's get ready to punch. I want to pack as much technique as possible onto this tape, so I'm not going to take the time to demonstrate a full warm-up. But you should do one, though. Your whole body takes a beating when you punch. If you don't warm up thoroughly, you risk pulling muscles right and left. Minimum warm up should consist of one, gentle stretching, not to increase flexibility, just to loosen up. Two, from three to 10 minutes of jumping rope or other whole body aerobic exercise. Three, at least five minutes of light punching to warm up the specific muscles involved. Also as part of your preliminaries, you should tape your hands. This becomes increasingly important as you start to develop some real power. Skip this step and you can end up with stress fractures of the delicate metacarpal bones in the back of your hand. Besides, it's cheap insurance. Tapes are available for a few dollars from most sporting goods stores or you can order them directly from Health for Life. To learn to tape up, match your hand to mine in front of your screen. Start by putting the loop over your thumb and draping the tape across the back of your hand. The first wrap goes around the wrist. This one's done fairly loosely. If you wrap it too tightly, you'll cut off your circulation. Next, loop around the palm, then around the knuckles, keeping the tape as flat as possible. Wrinkles hurt if they're between you and whatever you're hitting. Make a second wrap around the knuckles. Then come around halfway again. Now, loop around each finger to provide support for your knuckles. As you make the loops, keep your fingers stretched out like this. If you don't, the tape will end up too tight and you won't be able to close your fist when you're finished. Come across the back of your hand on a diagonal here. Then loop around to the other side, creating an X pattern. Now go back around the fingers, creating loops in the opposite direction from the way you did a moment ago. 
Don't worry about keeping the tape flat during this part. In fact, you want to bunch it up around the base of your fingers. Otherwise, again, you won't be able to close your hand. Now, wiggle your fingers around to make sure the tape's loose enough so you can close your fist. Then continue around the palm, around the knuckles. Make a series of loops like this until you've got oh, about a foot of tape left. At that point, make a final pass around the palm, then pull the tape down into the crook of the thumb and wrap the remaining tape around your wrist to stabilize that area. Finally, either using your teeth or help from a partner, tie the tape. The important thing here is to hold on to one of the little strings to keep the tape tight. If the tape starts to unravel, you'll lose much of the stability it's supposed to provide. Well, that's it. Tape both hands using the same procedure. Next order of business, a starting position, or stance. For the record, when you're actually punching, it's unlikely you'll be in any sort of formal stance. You'll be dodging and bobbing and weaving. But when learning, you gotta start from somewhere. Again, our stance will be based on sound biomechanics and not the guidelines of any one style. Lee details a similar one in the Davjit Kundo. Chris is gonna help me demonstrate. We're gonna work off a line on the floor, representing the line between you and your opponent. If you put both feet on the line, you're in a very unstable position. Chris, stand here, both feet on the line. Okay. If you sit from the side, no stability. At best, he loses his balance. At worst, he may end up on his back. You need a position offering good stability. But it must also provide a base for quick movement. Okay, get down really low, plant yourself. And this is great for stability, but if he tries to move fast from this position, Likewise, if he gets up on his toes with his feet close together, well, this is great for quick movement, but all it takes is one good in the shoulder and you're off balance. So we compromise. Start with your feet slightly wider than shoulder width apart. Toe of the front foot to the line, heel of the rear foot to the line. The diagonal improves your ability to take lateral blows. Now, rotate the rear foot forward so your toe is pointing almost straight forward. Drop the rear knee down, raise the rear heel slightly. When you launch into a punch, the goal is to push yourself forward, not up. If you start with your heel down, you waste energy pushing up. The front foot should be turned in at a 45 degree angle. This at least gives you a chance to save your knee by pivoting the front leg if that leg gets kicked. Both knees should be bent. You can't move with your knees locked. If you start with them locked, any movement must be preceded by bending them and that can tip off your opponent. Your weight should be evenly distributed on your legs. Once again, front foot at 45, rear foot pointing almost straight forward, rear heel off the ground, both knees bent, weight distribution 50-50. Next in the chain, your hips. They have a range of motion from fully open, where it feels as if you're seated, to fully closed, where the front leg is straightened out and the upper body is sideways to the opponent. All punches start midway between these two extremes. Shoulders open up slightly to allow rotation to build up punching speed. Arms, front arm, two to four inches from the torso. Angle at the elbow should be about 90 degrees. Rear hand in front of the sternum. Both fists should lie on the center line. Point of strategy. Control of the fight depends largely on control of the center line. Force an opponent's shoulder past the center line or arm off the center line and you have the advantage. Our arms in stance is designed to help you keep control. Fist. Martial artists have traditionally placed the thumb on the side. I prefer the thumb up and pulled back against the top of the hand for two reasons. First, pulling the thumb back makes it easier to line up the bones in the back of your hand which increases the stability of your fist. Second, with your thumb up and pulled back, it's less likely you'll get it snagged on your opponent's clothing and break it. Finally, head. Keep the chin down, makes it harder to hit, and allows you, when necessary, to support it against your shoulder to take incoming blows. Reviewing. Front foot at 45. Rear foot facing forward, heel up. Both knees bent. 
Hips midway between fully opened and fully closed. Shoulders slightly open. Both fists on the center line. Chin down. One final point before we get to the technique. There are a lot of martial arts training tools available. Heavy bags, makiwara, speed bags. By far the most useful in learning to punch is the hand pad because it gives you such good feedback. You can tell by the pop and by the position of the impact on your knuckles when you've really landed one right. Likewise, your partner can feel how you're doing and help you focus with comments like, you're punching high and to the left. Hand pads are available for most martial arts supply stores. Okay, we've warmed up, taped hands, and chosen the stance. Let's put on the gloves and get down to business. The jab. Let's talk about one of Dempsey's key principles for this punch. If you could somehow get above your opponent and fall on his head, you could do some serious damage. Well, Dempsey found a way of using this falling principle when jabbing. To learn how, let's do a quick exercise. Stand with your arm extended, palm about two inches away from a wall or heavy bag. Get into your stance. Now, pick up the front leg. Now try it again, this time shifting more of your weight to your front foot. Keep adjusting your weight distribution until you get maximum forward pressure from picking up the front foot. Then increase the power still further by pushing off with the rear leg at the same time you lift the front foot. You incorporate the leg collapse into your footwork by combining it with a technique taken from fencing called the step drag, which looks like this. The step drag is actually two separate movements. First, the step. This should literally feel like someone has attached a rope to your knee and is yanking your leg off the ground. Work for the same feeling as when you were doing the leg collapse. After the step, drag the rear leg forward the same distance that your front foot moved. Work to make each of these movements as quick as possible. Your ending position should be exactly the same as the starting position, except for your being farther forward. As you practice, pretend there's a board above your head. Stay low. Keep your knees bent and don't bounce. You want all of your energy directed forward and not up. Also, keep your upper body upright. Resist the tendency of the upper body to lag behind as you step forward, or you'll lose power. If you can get somebody to help you practice, have them trigger your steps by clicking together a couple of sticks behind their back, like this. The purpose is to make the step a response and not something you decide to do, because half the time, the stimulus to punch is going to come from something the other guy does, and you want to have trained yourself to take advantage of those openings. Reviewing jab footwork. Starting from your stance, you want to couple front leg collapse with a step drag. When doing the step drag, each of the foot movements should be separate. Stay low, remember the board above your head. Keep your knees bent, your hips slightly open, and remember to push off with the rear leg. Okay. I've said one key to punching power is to get as much of your body weight behind the movement as possible. There are two ways to do that, and the jab involves both. The first is with a forward step, like I've just described. The second is by rotating your body around its center line. That rotation starts at the hips. Remember, our stance places the hips midway between their two extremes, open and closed. When you jab, the hips close. There's tremendous power in this hip movement. Watch what happens when I place my hand on Chris's chest and just snap my hips. Hip action is one of the secrets behind power punching. Okay, upper body. Like the hips, the upper body also starts in a slightly open position. This puts the muscles of the mid torso on a stretch. When you jab, the rotation of the hips increases that stretch. And it's just like stretching a rubber band. When you release it, a force is generated. 
you increase that force by using muscle to rotate the upper body as well. Feet, hips, upper body. You see what's happening? The force is moving up the body in a wave, gathering momentum as each new section of the body contributes. The next action occurs at the shoulders. Just as you wait to rotate the upper body until the hips have twisted, so you let the arm action lag behind rotation of the upper body, so stretch and then contraction of the shoulder muscles can add to the power of the punch. Overemphasized, the resulting motion looks like you're cranking your arm around a wheel. With practice, that motion becomes almost imperceptible. But it's really significant in terms of punching power. When you're practicing, go ahead and really crank the elbow up just to get the feel of it. It's much easier to get it down that way. Finally, arm motion. If you were to punch in a true straight line relative to your upper body, you'd get this. Because your upper body is rotating. That's clearly not what you want. To make your fist travel along the center line, it actually must move in a curved path away from your upper body. This has the added advantage of automatically blocking an incoming jab from your opponent. Watch. Opponent punches, you punch. Your punch deflects his. Throwing the punch like the classic haymaker, where the arm arcs in from the side, makes it relatively easy to block. And if your opponent misses, his shoulder crosses the center line, giving you the advantage. Reviewing. Your fist should follow the center line all the way to the target. When you practice, make sure you program in the cranking action at the shoulder by overemphasizing the circular path of the elbow. Upper body, shoulder, arm, fist. Fist should connect with the target at a 45 degree angle. There's a lot of controversy about which knuckles to use. Some styles advocate using the top two, basing their argument on the strength of the bones behind them. Dempsey and several of the Chinese Kung Fu stylists recommend using the bottom three because of the natural power line and because of the chance to rock the wrist up before impact, adding one more joint action to the chain. Well, Dempsey always punched with gloves on. And we feel the danger of taking the brunt of the stress on the little finger knuckle and breaking it far outweighs the advantage of using the bottom three. Use the top three. This gives you the stability of the larger hand bones plus enough of a change of angle to take advantage of the power line. When you jab, all the movements we've been talking about follow one after another in a continuous flow. Feet, hips, upper body, shoulder, arm, each movement builds upon the last. Overall, the punch is similar to cracking a whip. A quick snapping motion that emerges from a relaxed state. The punch looks like this. Reviewing, step drag plus front leg collapse, hip rotation, upper body rotation, cranking action at the shoulder, elbow up to practice, fist lands at a 45 degree angle, thumb on top. Other important points. One, penetrate. Aim at a point two inches beyond your target. You don't want to just slap the surface of the glove. Two, make sure your fist lands before your front foot hits the ground. Watching in slow motion, movement starts, fist hits glove, then foot hits ground. 
If your foot hits the ground first, you essentially short circuit the transfer of force to your target. Three, when you connect, pretend what you've hit is red hot, and if you don't get your arm out of there fast, you're gonna get burned. Four, when recovering, lead down with the elbow to get your ribs protected again as quickly as possible. Five, as you retract your arm, drag your rear leg forward to complete the step drag. You lose power if you leave your rear foot in place. Six, relaxation is key. You can't move if you're tense. Start out tense and you have to relax before you can punch. Your opponent can see you do that. Tense only at the moment of impact. Starting out relaxed also applies to your mind and spirit. If you're all turned up inside and you've got a running dialogue going, okay, I'm gonna punch now. You'll telegraph your move every time. Pointers for holding the hand pads. Tighten up your fingers inside the glove as if they were in a baseball mitt. Provide resistance at the moment of impact. Then return the glove to target position as quickly as possible. Stand sideways to your partner to give yourself maximum range of motion in which to absorb the force of the blow. If you stand face on, you risk tearing your shoulder muscles. Also, angle the glove slightly to match the incoming angle of the blow. When you practice, work both left and right sides equally. You're only as good as your weakest punch. And besides, once you learn the punch on your good side, you'll probably find it's not so bad learning it on your weaker side. Don't worry if it's a little uncomfortable at first. You'll get it eventually. Okay, Chris, why don't you throw a few? This is our second linear punch. Like the jab, the cross also involves a sequence of joint actions. In this case, starting at the knees and working up. Unlike the jab, the cross does not involve a forward step. Here, you get your body weight behind the movement solely by rotating your body around the center line. Starting from your stance, you want to rotate the rear foot forward and drop the knee down. Next, rotate their hips from their starting midpoint position to fully open the exact opposite of jab motion. Rotation continues with the upper body. Go past the point where you're fully open to your opponent, so you're not so exposed, and because greater range of movement means more power. Make the shoulder stretch work for you here too. And once again, the elbow should crank up as if going around a big wheel. Fist should follow the center line all the way to the target. This means it's actually moving in the same kind of outward arc as during the jab. At impact, fish should be at a 45 degree angle to the vertical as a result of the elbow movement. Avoid the haymaker tendency. A circular movement is easier to block, easier to trap, and not nearly as powerful. Reviewing. The rear foot rotates so the toes are pointing straight forward. The rear knee bends. Hips rotate to fully open. Upper body rotates past the fully open position. Shoulder cranks, remember the wheel. Elbow goes around the wheel. Arm moves in a slight outward arc. Fist lands at about a 45 degree angle to the vertical. Other important points. One. Aim at a point two inches or so behind your target. There is no power without penetration. Two, at the moment of impact, once again, pretend the target is red hot and you have to pull back quickly to avoid getting burned. Three, fully commit to the movement. There's a strong tendency not to rotate all the way through. This not only diminishes your power, but leaves you more exposed. Four, lead out with the hand, back with the elbow. Pretend someone is going to roundhouse you in the ribs, because they might. Get that elbow back into place as quickly as possible. 
to refine the movement, have your partner try to swat your hand out of the way as you're practicing. Soon, you'll develop enough speed that no one will be able to hit your hand, much less get out of your way. Pointers for holding the hand pads. Adjust the angle of the pad to match the incoming angle of the punch. Now, the first of our two circular punches, the hook. The hook is a much shorter range weapon than either jab or cross. It's generally used for body punches. But it has other uses as well, like getting an opponent's hands out of the way. The hook relies on rotation of the body around its center line for power. That rotation begins at the feet, which rotate independently, rear foot first, like this. Ending position is identical to starting position, only you're facing the other direction. Notice that as the rear foot becomes the, in quotes, front foot, the heel goes down. Likewise, as the front foot becomes the rear, the heel goes up. This generates maximum torque or twisting power. Rotation continues at the hips, which move from their halfway open starting position to fully closed. As with both of the previous punches, arm action is delayed slightly to put the shoulder muscles on a stretch. Then that stretch plus contraction of shoulders and chest whip the arm across. In the hook, the idea is to deliver the power at a right angle to the line between you and your opponent. For maximum transfer of force, the forearm must also be at a right angle to that line. Here or here, and you lose power. When throwing the punch, bend forward slightly at the waist. Also, until you uncork the arm action, your arm should feel as if it's glued to your side. Don't cock by bringing the elbow back behind yourself. This gives your opponent a really obvious clue about what you're about to do. At the moment of impact, your fist should be vertical. Then continue the movement on through to bring your hand back to guard position. It's really important that you don't stop your hand to change direction. This slows you down and wastes energy. Reviewing. Rotation at the rear foot, then the front foot, hips and upper body. Shoulder lags slightly, but this doesn't mean to cock your arm. Arm at a right angle to the line between you and your opponent. Slight forward lean. Fist vertical at the moment of impact. Return to starting position without interrupting circular movement. Other important points. One, speed up the punch by pulling the fist in towards you just before the moment of impact. Two, to begin with, practice the hook a few punches per session only. You'll find the tendons along the edge of your wrist below your thumb get really sore at first, but that doesn't last long. Pointers for holding the hand pads. The glove should be pointed straight at the puncher, not angled. Try not to move the glove in anticipation of the punch impact that throws off the person punching. Hold the glove at just higher than waist height.
back knuckle, or back fist, is our final punch. Footwork here is exactly the same as for the jab. It's a step drag. Collapse the front leg, push off with the rear, then drag the rear leg forward. Back knuckle hip and upper body movement are in two parts. As you do the step part of the step drag, both close slightly in a wind up. Then the hips snap open. Arm action lags behind just slightly to put the lower torso muscles on a stretch. Then the upper body opens as well. This close then open happens so fast it's almost imperceptible. But it's very important in terms of getting maximum power out of the sequence of joint actions. Arm action is also a combination of two simultaneous moves. Bringing the elbow up to align it with the target and extending the arm at the elbow. Together, those moves look like this. Two things to avoid with the arm motion. First, the elbow crossing the center line. This exposes you more than necessary and wastes power. Second, this kind of movement. Here, the elbow is actually moving in toward the center line in the opposite direction from the fist. In essence, your arm is no longer pivoting at your elbow. Now, it's pivoting around some point in your forearm. This dramatically shortens the length of the lever that you're using to smash your target, like using a hammer with a three-inch handle to drive in a nail. The result, a radical decrease in speed and power. The fist. In the back knuckle, the fist is relaxed until the moment of impact. It trails, bent at the wrist, and then snaps shut at the last possible second. This adds one more joint action to the chain, increasing the velocity of your fist. Reviewing. Back knuckle starts with a leg collapse and step drag. Hips and upper body both close, then reopen in an imperceptible snapping motion. Arm action is a combination of raising and extending the elbow. Hand remains relaxed until just before the moment of impact, then snaps shut as it hits the target. Important points to keep in mind. One, aim at a point behind the glove. Two, don't let the elbow cross the center line as you extend your arm. Three, as in the jab, your fist should hit the target before your front foot hits the ground or you lose power. Four, after connecting with the target, get your hand out of there fast. You lead in with the fist, but lead out with the elbow to get yourself covered up again as quickly as possible. Pointers for holding the hand pads. Glove at head height, angled slightly downward to match the angle of the incoming punch. Okay, here we go. To further improve your technique, let's take a look at the most common errors for each of the four punches. Jab first. No step or leg collapse. Front leg should collapse. You should push off with the rear leg. Front foot hitting the ground before fist hits the target. Fist should land before foot. Starting with the hips too closed or hips too open. You should start with the hips at the midpoint of their range of motion. Starting with the shoulders too closed. Shoulders should be at about a 45 degree angle. Not raising the elbow high enough. Correctly, notice the elbow cranking action. Punching in a noticeable arc. Fist should travel straight up the center line, no hooking motion. 
Whole body too stiff. Stay relaxed until moment of impact. Also, too much preliminary thought and winding up. Beginning of the punch should be an explosion. The cross. Rear leg too straight. Rear knee should bend as the hip rotates. Not twisting through with hips and upper body. Work for full hip and upper body rotation. Arm out too far, fist traveling in an arc. Fist should travel straight up the center line. Elbow not coming up high enough. Remember the cranking action. Winding up. There should be no preliminary movement. The hook. Not pivoting on the balls of both feet. Both feet should pivot, rear foot first. Not enough hip twist. Hips begin at the midpoint of their range and then snap closed. Hip twist is a major contributor to hook power. Body upright. The lower the target, the more you should lean forward. Fist striking target at a weak angle. Forearm should be at a right angle to the center line. Stopping fist to change direction for recovery. Fist should circle on through, back to guard position. Winding up. There should be no preliminary movement. And finally, back knuckle. Front foot hitting the ground before fist hits target. Fist should land before front foot. Starting to open. Shoulder should start at a 45 degree angle. Entire arm crossing the center line before impact. Or elbow starts out across the center line. You must keep control of the center line. The elbow shouldn't cross until the moment of impact. Winding up. There should be no preliminary movement. The single punches are fine, but combinations are better. The linear punches go together really nicely. Remember the old one-two? You can use the jab as a setup for the cross. When working the jab cross combo, practice both with a side step and standing still. There's a natural tendency to thrust the cross glove forward as you throw the jab. Tell your partner to hold the glove steady. An important point, never, never use a cross as a setup for a jab. Leading with the rear hand, that is, starting off a combo with any punch from your rear hand, exposes you to easy counterattack. That's a major problem with the martial arts reverse punch. It just physically takes more time to punch with the rear hand. An opponent who learns you lead off with the rear hand can take advantage by counterpunching with his front, like this. You can also combine the circular punches. Both hook back knuckle and back knuckle hook are effective combinations. To practice, have your partner hold the hook glove farther forward than the back knuckle glove.
Now, let's combine the linear and circular moves. The classic jab cross hook. Your partner should drop the jab glove into hook position as soon as he or she feels the impact of your jab. Make sure you fully extend the lead arm when jabbing. Then, fully twist the upper body for the cross. Finally, throw the hook, guarding with the cross hand. Practice this combo without taking any forward steps to help develop rotational speed. Just for practice, try jab, cross, hook, back knuckle, cross. That one takes almost as much work on the part of your glove holding partner, but it's a great workout, especially for increasing the speed and power of your rotational movements. Ultimately, your punching practice should consist of a full set of individual punches and combos. Work up to 20 of each in the order you learned them. Jab, cross, hook, back knuckle. As soon as you can, do the entire sequence without stopping for one side forward. In other words, left jab, right cross, left hook, left back knuckle. Then do the other side forward. Right jab, left cross, right hook, right back knuckle. I recommend working your weaker side first. By the way, my weaker side is now my stronger side after doing that for a number of years. Stick with single punches until you're comfortable with them. You want to train in precision on the individual moves and then combine them. When you do eventually work combos, start with jab cross. Work for full extension on both punches and for not losing your balance. Again, 10 to 20 combos per side. As you improve, Try jab cross hook. This is a lot more demanding. Listen to the rhythm of the impacts on the gloves and keep trying to decrease the amount of time in between. Keep your weight centered. Finally, begin work on the circular combos. Hook back knuckle and back knuckle hook. Here's the whole routine. Do 10 to 20 of each of the punches listed below. That is, 10 left jabs followed by 10 right crosses and so on down the list. Then do the same with the combos. For each side forward, do 10 to 20 jab cross, then 10 to 20 hook back fist. Next, again for each side, do 10 to 20 jab cross hook, and finally, do 10 to 20 jab cross hook back fist cross. Now it's up to you. Practice punching two to three times per week. Leave at least one day in between sessions to allow your muscles to recover. Punching every day can actually lead to diminished results. If you're doing supplementary conditioning work, like weight training, do all upper body work on the same days you punch. Alternating, punching on one day, then doing upper body exercises on the next, doesn't allow sufficient recovery time for the upper body muscles. Also, do supplementary work after you practice punching. As a general rule, Technique work should always come before conditioning exercise because it's very difficult to train subtle movement patterns into your nervous system if your muscles are tired. In the simplest form, your workout should consist of warm-up, technique work, and then conditioning exercise. That's it. Four punches. Jab, cross, hook, and back knuckle tools that will substantially increase the effectiveness of your hand techniques. Perhaps the way they're explained here differs from what you've learned. What's important is to use the differences, understand the principles involved, and see how they can best be applied. In this way, the great masters found their individual paths, and so can you.
I saw it coming a mile off. You've got to watch the preliminary movement. Yeah. There's lettuce on your ear. 